So good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us on this webinar with Universitat Bocconi. Uh, this is actually the second time we've done this exact webinar, but we've had several over the years um, talking specifically about how to apply to the university. And it has proven to be very popular and very helpful for a lot of students over the years. So hopefully you will get as much out of it as they have. Now, we are joined this evening by two representatives of the university, one on the administrative side and one on the study side, Elisa and Georgia, who will both introduce themselves in a moment. But I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce me first. Uh, my name is Mark Huntington. I am the managing director of an organization called A Star Future. And our role in all of this is basically to try and make British educated students aware of international universities and higher education opportunities. So not limited to just Bocconi, but obviously this evening, that is all we are going to talk about. If you want to know about anything else, contact me another time. Um, but the format for this evening is that Elisa is going to give a brief introduction of the university. We will then hear a little from Georgia and who she is and why she's here on this session. Then we're going to get stuck into the nuts and bolts of the application process. So all of your questions about that will be answered, don't worry. And finally, we'll then have questions a lot more about the student experience with Georgia uh, and anything else you should happen to want to know. With that in mind, questions, please put them in the Q&A. We will get to them all at the end, I promise you that. We may be able to answer one or two of them uh, as we go, uh, but essentially we're going to try and run through all of the presentations as quickly as possible and then spend the bulk of time answering whatever it is you wish to know about. So without further ado, I'm going to hand straight over to Elisa Ravelia from the university and she will give a brief introduction as to who Bocconi is. Everyone, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here today. As Mark said, my name is Elisa and I work for the Bocconi Guinness Recruitment Office, uh, where we advise students who are thinking of uh, studying at Bocconi, especially com coming from international schools and schools abroad. I'll share my screen in a bit. Okay, you should be able to, one second, see the presentation. There we go. Okay. I guess if you're here, guys, you already know a bit about Bocconi, or maybe you've heard about the university. Uh, but just to give you some background information, um, Bocconi is, a, I usually say, a pretty old institution. We were founded more than 100 years ago by an Italian businessman as a private not-for-profit institution. Why am I telling you the story? Well, because we stand as a business university, and indeed, uh, we were the first university in Italy to grant a degree in economics. We evolved from that in the last years, and we will see how in a bit when we will take a look at the programs, but that's, let's say, the background that we have. Uh, Bocconi has always very much uh, been um, interested in internationalization on one side, um, and this is witnessed by the fact that we had our first exchange programs back in the 1970s, and we have been teaching in English for more than 20 years. So if one of the first questions that you have is, do I need to speak Italian to go and study at Bocconi? The answer is no. So that's not a hurdle you should consider. Um, as a general, let's say a, a few data for you to have a better idea about the uni. We are a medium-sized university. We have around 15,000 students on campus. And again, you see the internationalization part that is also reflected in numbers here. So our students come from more than 100 different nationalities of 100 different countries. And in the English taught programs, more than 40% of the students are international. So they come from abroad. Um, I guess if you guys are choosing or looking at universities, you might be using international league tables to compare different institutions. With Mark, we usually say that rankings won't tell you the whole story, won't be the only thing you should keep in mind. Uh, they might be a help in giving you some indications, some things to keep in mind when, cho keep in mind when choosing a university. Um, at Bocconi, we're ranked, among, uh, we're ranked by the Financial Times as the fifth best business school in Europe. Uh, and we are also by the QS ranked among the top, top 10 universities worldwide, both for business and management, social sciences and management, and accounting and finance in Europe. Uh, what does this tell you? It doesn't tell you everything. It tells you that Bocconi is very good in those subjects, that if you're looking to study those subjects, the reputation of Bocconi is very high, and a number of different things. But let's not do, uh, dwell too much on numbers, sorry, uh, because as, as said, those are not the only thing you should be keeping in mind. I mentioned at the beginning that 
internationalizations and the international outlook for us, for Bocconi, has always been one of the greatest driving factors. And you see that this is witnessed by this, the numbers here. So we have a very broad international network. So a network of universities we work with worldwide, those are more than 280. And those universities are places where you can go and attend one semester, do an exchange program while being a Bocconi student. We have Georgia here today who will then tell you her upcoming experience about this. But the great thing is that Bocconi can be your starting point. So you will be able to start at Bocconi Milan. But during this Bocconi experience, you can also be able to apply to spend one semester abroad. We work with all the main IV universities in the States, Latin America, Europe, Asia, Oceania. So really there's a wide uh, array of choices for you ahead. One thing you might not be considering right now or that might not be at the top of your list that, uh, but that will be in a few years or I guess so when you start studying at university are career prospects. Uh, so what are you going to do afterwards when you graduate? Well, um, Bocconi has a very strong career service. So what we try and do is support our students while they study in finding internships and after they graduate in finding job offers. How do we do that? Uh, organizing career fairs both in Milan and abroad digitally obtaining the last couple of years to um, organizing uh, I would say um, sector specific events for example we have once per year the investment banking weekends where investment banks come to Milan and recruit students on the spot at Bocconi for uh, summer internships or jobs uh, recruiting dates where we have companies coming on to, to Bocconi and recruiting students or explaining students how the recruitment process works. This helps you, of course, uh, in landing an internship, landing a job afterwards and getting some work experience before you graduate. Last but not least, uh, the I would say the people, the students you will study with at Bocconi will be then your future network. And that's our alumni network. Um, it's not just a very important personal network, but also work-wise and employer-wise, this is a great research that our students and graduates have, because wherever you go in the world, you will find a Bocconi graduate uh, most uh, likely. In London, we have a huge alumni community. So especially if you're interested in uh, working in the financial sector, for example, uh, London is one of the ma main places where our students go. Then it depends, of course, on the sector, uh, the economic area, the country, but really we're all, our graduates are really all over the place. Um, what can you study at Bocconi? Well, I mentioned at the beginning that we were born as a business university. So I put up this pie chart here that what you can see is that even today, the vast majority of the subjects that we teach are related to the business field. So we have management, economics and finance that are embraced by the word business, so to say. Uh, but we also then launched some new programs that are, re are related to more upcoming, I would say, subjects, data science, for example, so computer science and maths for artificial intelligence. Since a few years, we've also been teaching political science. And the great news is for the next year that we will also be launching a new program in international law. I will tell you about that in a bit. I put up here the list of the programs that we actually have at undergraduate level, so what we call the bachelor programs. Um, the first thing I would like to underline is the length of the program. The programs are three years. Again, as I said at the beginning, entirely taught in English. If you apply to Bocconi and you're admitted, you're admitted to one specific program, not to the uni itself. So you should choose and do a bit of research to understand which ones you would like to list in your application. Uh, as you see here, we have broader programs, international econ and ma management, which is basically international business, or econ and finance, which is a bit more quantitative. We then have even more quantitative programs such as economics, economics and computer science. So if you're into data science, uh, machine learning, um, data analytics, all that side, that's a program for you. The program in math and computing science for artificial intelligence. So if you're a uh, enthusiast in all the AI, physics, uh, math stuff and computing science stuff, that's a great program again to consider. I also mentioned that since a few years we teach international politics. The program that we have is called International Politics and Government and it's close to what in the UK you might find as PPE because it has a strong part of economics in it. So you should think that it is a politics program but don't think that you will disregard completely the economic side because you will have economics related exams every year throughout the three years. Um, we also have a program in management for arts, culture and communication that, of course, being based in Milan takes advantage also of the environment that we have uh, and all, all the cultural heritage um, associations and organizations that we have on the ground. 
Since next year, uh, I just said, we are also launching a program in Global Law. It will be a BA, a three-year program again. Um, the focus will be on all those upcoming, I would say, legal um, professions ranging from, for example, data protection officers to um, legal professionals that work in international organizations, in international firms, international consultancy companies, um, contract law, previously law. So the idea is to prepare students who are able, who will be able to enter the job market in such positions and will work mainly in the international setting. So it's not a program that prepares you to be the classical, I would say, lawyer. Uh, you will be able to do that afterwards if you want to go on with a master in your own country, if you want to practice law. But law is a very complex, I would say, uh, subject. So this program, it is, is for the professions I mentioned before. So more for the international, I would say, law um, setting. Uh, we also have a program which is called World Bachelor in Business, which is a four-year program done with the University of Southern California and Hong Kong University of Technology. I won't spend too, too much time on this one since it's a very peculiar one. It is a three-degree program lasting four, year, four years. It has different admission procedures because, of course, as you can imagine, and different costs as well. Um, it is a very a peculiar, peculiar, I would say, program. Um, without further ado, I think I will pass back the word to Mark, and then we will uh, resume with permissions in a bit. Okay, so thank you very much, Elisa. So that gives us a very uh, general overview as to what University of Bocconi is all about, what kind of things you can study there. And obviously, we will come back to talk a lot more about entry requirements and fees and all the things you need to know about that in just one moment. But before we do that, I would like to introduce our second speaker, or more correctly, I would like to invite Georgia to introduce herself. So. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me well? Yeah, go ahead. Great, great. Uh, thank you. Welcome, everybody. So my name is Georgia, and I'm an Italian British student uh, in my second year of a Bachelor of Bocconi University. Um, I, like I said, I'm Italian from origin, but I grew up in the UK. I attended a grammar school up until GCSEs, and then I moved uh, and did an international boarding school where I did the international baccalaureate um, up until I applied to Bocconi. I joined not in the early session, but the regular session. However, I can still talk about my experiences, and I'm now studying a Bachelor in Economic and Social Sciences. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, Georgia, I just wanted to ask you about the program you're doing, the economics and social sciences. I think the economics is perfectly clear, but what would you do within the social sciences there? What, what kind of things typically make up your uh, class load? Yeah, so the social sciences is actually very broad and not uh, the way many people usually assume it to be. Uh, it's actually a very quantitative theoretical course. So what we study is uh, economics, how, how individuals and societies make decisions and functions, but through a very theoretical perspective. So we use a lot of uh, math, statistics, um, uh, yeah, and the economic analysis. So even though it sounds like a very humanistic course, it is actually one of the more quantitative heavy ones. So it's aware of the names, but... So yeah. there's no escaping quantitative analysis of humanity, basically. As Absolutely. A society. No, That's no, no. <laughs> interesting. Okay. But it's not a soft option for those who don't like math, so let's put it that way. Exactly, exactly. Okay, probably not. Now, could I just ask Georgia, I mean, obviously, you have Italian heritage, which uh, is not something that all of our visitors on or attendees will have this evening. Certainly, it's not the case that we only want people who are Italian to go to Milan. A a absolutely not. All are welcome. But could I just ask, I mean, did you know Bocconi from years back? Was it something you'd already always thought of? Or how did you make that decision to go and study in Milan rather than, I guess, London or, you know, Bristol or whatever else you might have done in the UK? Yeah, so for me, I mean, as an Italian, Bocconi is an institution that at least among Italians is very, very highly known. Um, however, even also going to an international school, a lot of students tend to apply abroad already. And I think that's why I started to think about um, applying outside of the UK to begin with and already just from the rankings it shows up pretty quickly as an option especially if you're interested in more economic fields um, and I can say my alternative to studying uh, at Bocconi would have been uh, um, PPE philosophy politics and, politics and economics uh, in Warwick University so at the time I will be honest I, I did fall for the trap of social sciences being a less quantitative subject so whereas maybe initially I would have applied to the a uh, big uh, politics and governance program, uh, which is more similar to PPE. I'm very happy of 
the more theoretical course. And for me, the decision came down to rather than the actual subjects because I thought they were the same or similar things. Um, it was more the, the lifestyle and choosing to live somewhere outside um, of London and of the UK for me to connect to my Italian roots, uh, but also Milan. And I can speak about it a bit later. It's a very strategic location and fun location as a student uh, in these years. Right. But this is the first time in your life that you've actually lived in Italy then? Exactly, exactly. And I will say um, I, I learned to speak Italian much better since being here, but it's also not a prerequisite to, to get by. Um, and yeah, I've enjoyed the more Italian side, but it's a very international community. Yeah, well, I, I think you'll find the whole student body, and I mean, uh, Elise has already mentioned this a little bit, is extremely international. Now, Georgia, obviously, thank you for introducing yourself. We're going to come back to you. Uh, in quite some detail a little bit later on, I'm sure of that, because I am pretty confident that nearly all the questions that come up later on will be things that require your input. So, uh, yep, just hold fire and we'll come back to you in one second. But I'm now going to pass back to Elisa uh, to go through the more technical aspects of applying to Bocconi. Yes, there we go. So, um, if you're now thinking of applying to Bocconi, how do you do that and when do you do that? Well, first, you do not apply through UCAS. Bocconi has its own application system, um, so you need to apply through our own portal. What we consider are three main elements, actually two are the biggest ones in the application, a selection test, which can be an SAT, an ACT, or our own test, which is called Bocconi test. Uh, we will see a few details in a bit, uh, just anticipate it is an online test you can take. And then school transcript, so the final GPA of your second and third last year of high school. So if you're uh, attending a British curriculum, this means the GCSEs and the ASs level year. If you're doing the IB, this means middle year programs or GCSEs in IB year one. Uh, for the American system, this would mean, for example, sophomore and junior year, so on and so forth. So uh, those two years, we want to see how you progress during high school, how your academic, how I would say strong your academic background is. Uh, plus for international students, we always ask, ask you to upload a CV and a personal statement. We want to know a bit about you, anything that we can really understand besides your grades. What do you do after class? Have you taken part in any specific project, any special projects, any extracurricular activity? And in the personal statement, we want to know why are you applying to Bocconi? Why to those specific courses you're listing? Um, to be honest, as you see from the percentages here, uh, the application is mainly the quantitative part, so the test and high school transcript. So why did we put the CV and personal statement there? Well. Uh, those are taken into account for scholarship reasons, so if you're being evaluated for a merit scholarship, and also uh, these are very useful when two students maybe are at the same, uh, I would say, level in the admission rankings, then their own experiences, their own motivation can make the difference, so always put some work in that. Um, when you're applying, you will be able to list up to four programs you're interested in, in order of preference. So the first one is the one you like best, and then you can list three additional others. Um, and once you submit your application, basically, it usually requires us between one and two months to get back to you with the result. When do you apply? And then we go also a bit more into depth in the uh, Bocconi test part. Well, um, we have three application rounds. The first application round, it's called the early session. If some of you are familiar with Bocconi, you might reckon that the timing has changed a bit since the past years. The early session is the session that is dedicated to students who are just finishing their second to last year of high school and are entering their last year of high school, so junior students. Um, Application for the early session will open on the 20th of July and close on the 22nd of September, with results being um, published in October. So basically, at the end, at the beginning of your last year of high school, you will know if you got admitted into Bocconi or not. The second application round is called winter session. This runs from November this year until January next year, with the results being out in May, in March, sorry, and the spring session that is the last round from March till April 2023 with the results in May 2023. If your question is, when should I apply? Well, the first, the biggest rounds are the early session and the winter session. The spring session is really residual, only 10% of the places are available in that one. So it's better to apply early. Can you reapply? Yes, you can reapply. So if you're really interested in Bocconi, the advice would be try and apply in the early session. If you're not admitted, you can still reapply in the winter session. Um, 
if you're deciding to apply with the Bocconi test, which, which as we have seen is one of the three options that you have when it comes to the test, um, the Bocconi test has changed format this year. It will be available from late July, probably a few days before the application will open, until a few days before, uh, so, sorry, until late March 2023. You can take the test whenever you want. So you go into the test uh, platform, you book your test. You can take the test a maximum of three times for the total of the three application rounds, okay? Uh, you can choose, again, whenever you want to take the test, the time and the date, only a few days. Uh, there are only a few days in which you cannot do that. So that is really, I would say, um, it, it, we try to accommodate the, the, the needs of the students. Um, the important thing you should keep in mind, though, is that you need to have with you a test score when you apply. So if you're applying with the Bocconi test, you need to do the Bocconi test before the deadline you want to apply in closes because you need to have your Bocconi test with you and upload it in your application. OK, this is very important. It is very different from last year's. So make sure that you do the test before you need to, you apply before the, the deadline you want to apply in closes. Um, so keep that in mind. Same thing with the SAT and with the ACT. If you want to apply with those tests, you need to have the official score with you at the time you apply in. OK. How does the Bocconi test work? Well, uh, we already said you have three attempts per academic year to be taken uh, at you know, your preference, but before the deadline you want to apply in. There's a test fee of 60 euros and the test has changed structure a bit too. Uh, it is now a 75 minute test with 50 multiple choice questions, uh, more, a bit more than a half are in math. And then we have questions, reading comprehension, numerical reasoning and critical thinking. The test has been slightly changed to reflect a bit more the SAT structure, okay? So it should be similar to that one. Um, as you see here, we have a different uh, a specific uh, policy point. Um, right answer, you get one point. Uh, missing answer, zero points. Wrong answer, minus 0 0.2, uh, 0, sorry, um, and two points. The idea is that it is a time management and risk management test. We want to see how you perform under pressure uh, when you have a short amount of time at your disposal. Do you answer? Do you leave the question? Do you anyway try and attempt uh, answering it? So it's also a strategy test as well. OK, um, so that's the, the, the say the, the general um, admission part. Um, before leaving back to Mark, I'll say a couple of words about uh, admission, about, sorry, fees and funding, um, which I know sometimes we get questions from, especially from uh, on the scholarships point. And then in the Q&A, we can go back to the admission part uh, for any of you guys' doubts. Um, Bocconi, as I said at the beginning, is a private uni, so it's, the cost is around 13,000 euros per year. Uh, students who apply are automatically evaluated for merit scholarships, so academic excellence scholarships, and those are based on the same elements we consider for admission. The merit scholarships can be 100% tuition waiver or 50% tuition waiver, waivers. In addition to that, we also have free relief targets and need-based scholarships that are not related to academic, uh, let's say, performance, but only to the student's um, family and economic condition. Okay, Mark, I think I'll pass back the word to you if you want to open up the Q&A. Okay, all right. So thank you very much, Elisa. So that gives you a, a quick overview of what the programs are, the fact that you can apply to four of them, um, but it's not the same system as you'll use in the UK. Inevitably, it's going to feel a bit weird when you apply to Bocconi, so don't be surprised if things are not quite what you're expecting. But it is one of the simpler systems to navigate once you actually really get into it. And there's plentiful help available um, should things not go, uh, or should not anything not be immediately apparent, let's put it that way. So hopefully at this stage, you've got a bit of a sense, like I was saying, of how to apply, how much it's going to cost, and what Bocconi is all about. Now, the bulk of this session from now on is going to be dedicated to questions. Please do get into the Q&A and ask whatever it is you might be interested in. But before you, um, before we get stuck into those, I am going to ask a few to um, Georgia. 
Uh, most specifically, Georgia, I want to come back to you on what the main focus of this evening is about. Now, you did mention earlier that you applied in the regular session rather than the early session. Uh, as Elisa has already pointed out, there are some differences to the whole process over what you experienced. So I'm not asking you to comment on, you know, the new exam or anything like that. But how did you find the process? I mean, how time consuming was it? How difficult was it? How helpful were the university in providing you information? All that kind of stuff. Yes. So, uh, like I said, I applied through the regular process and I would say it's very, I can't even remember spending that much time on it in terms of the, you know, the bureaucracy of it. It's pretty straightforward. I did not the book only test, but the SATs because it was offered near me. So this was before there was the online version, uh, which makes it now much more accessible. But I would say a benefit of the SAT, for example, is that uh, especially the English and English speakers, uh, it's useful for the, the English part, although however it is pretty mathematically heavy as well. Um, and I remember doing that. And then you had also your cover letter and the CV. Um, general advice on, on what to put is just, you know, showing yourself uh, and your interest in, in the general subject or why you want to be a book away. There's not a specific structure that you need to follow. Uh, it's more, yeah, showing the people what's... Uh, Okay, this is possibly quite an unfair question, but one that I'm really interested in, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, you obviously wrote a personal statement for UCAS at the same time, or near enough the same time, as you did a motivation letter for Bocconi. Could you honestly say there was any difference between the two of them, or how you approached it? I would say yes. Uh, I don't know, you know, if I had a right way or a wrong way of, of how I was I was writing it, but I would say the Bocconi test, or sorry, the Bocconi uh, cover letter, I was much more myself, and I was speaking less about... Uh, theoretical aspects and more just my personal experiences and how I engaged, I don't know, or showing, for example, my interest in the international community and how that's something that Bocconi had, or for example, the, the courses I was interested in and why, whereas I remember the UCAS, it was much more heavy on, uh, you know, for example, the, the books that I was reading or uh, specific articles that I thought linked to the course, um, I would say, yeah, I had much more freedom I felt in the, in the Bocconi application, so don't limit yourself the same way you might in UCAS, it's also, yeah, well, I think obviously I can't, page. I... I can't comment at all on how successful your personal statement was, but it seems like the one for Bocconi did the job. <laughs> so uh, good advice there in the sense that it worked for you. But I mean, I think the key point of that is, yeah, try and write something that's more about who you are as an individual. And this is often something that comes up with a lot of motivation letter requests and things like that from universities around the world. It's not as much of a, you know, an industry as a process as the personal statement is in UCAS. So don't feel that you have to treat it exactly the same way. And obviously as well, do make reference to the fact that this is an international experience. You know, it's like it's got to be a slightly different approach that you take when when composing that. Um, but since you've arrived, you know, well, obviously you you got your offer, so everything worked out successfully. Um, tell me a little bit about when you first arrived at the university. Now, obviously, you are coming up to the end of your second year, which means you started in a period of time which hopefully nobody else will ever experience. But how was it moving to Milan at that moment in time? I mean, uh, aside from the, the general difficulties with the, the whole pandemic, I think Bocconi was very, very accommodating to it. And I think I still had as much of a university experience as uh, many of my peers, even compared to the UK had. So I joined uh, a student residence last year and there we were able to stay even when you had the different zones and when it was tricky to, to go back to the UK. I remember the, the day before I had to fly back to the UK for Christmas was when the Delta variants came out and so last minute I was able to stay um, also with other students and we could still go on campus every other week and I would say now hopefully by the time you arrive as well we're down to zero restrictions uh, as we're currently heading to now but I would say it was still very uh, realistic to how it is now day to day without other restrictions. Well, obviously, we were all in Milan together about a month ago, and we were all wearing face masks inside. Has that changed now, or are you still having to do that? Uh, very, very recently, it's changing. So, okay. yeah. So you're becoming a little bit more relaxed about that. Exactly. Quite a lot. Exactly. Okay. Sorry, we've got somebody who's raised their hand right now. I'm gonna, I'll try this once just to see how it goes. Um, um, but obviously, we'll see. We'll see. Peter, um, I'm going to invite you to say something, should you wish. Okay, you are muted. I don't know if you're talking. Oh, 
Okay, that hasn't worked tremendously well, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that experiment, but maybe we'll revisit it a little bit later on. Um, but Georgia, so you arrived during COVID. You you're at the end of your second year now. How did you find the first year from an academic workload point of view? Um, one of the things we often hear from students who go abroad versus those who stay in the UK is that if you go somewhere like Bocconi, you're gonna have to work like crazy. Uh, is that true? I don't know if I would use the word crazy, but you do. It is a big jump from high school, but I think that's a, a leap you're, you're going to learn regardless of where, wherever you end up in university. Um, but I would say, yes, the workload is is a lot, but you also have enough material and enough contact hours with the professors and teaching assistants to get you through it. Uh, and like I said, for example, I came, I'm doing now a very mathematical quantitative course, but I did pretty much all humanities um, in ID. So I was doing Spanish, history, economics. Uh, so basically starting from zero into one of the more math heavy courses, uh, I had everything I needed to stay up to speed. But it is true that you need to, uh, yes, stay on top of your work pretty much from the beginning. So you were doing standard level maths as part of your IB, yeah? Exactly. Wow, okay. That is a question that will come up time and again. We are gonna get back to uh, maths, I can promise you that. Now, obviously you're coming up to the end of your um, second year. Um, what's going to happen in the next year for you then? Because that's your final year. How, how is that going to look for you? Yeah, so I would say Bocconi, uh, in all the bachelors, uh, it's, it's very structured. So you don't really choose your courses either in the first year or the second year. They start off very general and broad in the first year, get a bit more specialized in the second year, specifically second semester. And then in the third year, we have, um, again, some more specialized courses, but also electives. Um, so looking forward to that and, and seeing the options available. And then also in my second semester, I am going on exchange to Chile uh, for, yeah, to complete my studies abroad. Wow. So a few months down in, in Chile. Wow. That's, yeah. I hope, I'm sure that'll be fun. But do, do, do you have any ideas what you want to do after all of that as well? I know it's putting you on the spot a bit to think too far into your future. Um, but can you see where you're going to go next? So still a very open question. I mean, both geographically and uh, and also work-wise. I think I set it off uh, very strongly with the mentality of, you know, I'm here in Bocconi, Milan is a beautiful city, but I will stay just for three years and then go back to London to, to work. Um, and now I will say there still are job opportunities in Milan that, that make you consider staying, um, but also looking for to go back to London and definitely um, take yeah, a few years off university to begin with, and then perhaps see with the master words, uh, with the master, sorry, afterwards. Right, but a master's is definitely part of your plan, yeah? Uh, potentially, potentially. I, th I think uh, I've had enough, but there are enough skills that we've been given in the three years that you can go straight to work afterwards, although the majority of students do tend to, to pursue the master afterwards. Yeah, I think this is fair, fair comment on most European universities as well, and outside the UK, students do tend to more they're more likely to go on and do a master's degree anyway um and certainly we see this with british students who go abroad that during their time there they start thinking well actually maybe this is something i should be considering even when it wasn't initially part of their plan shall we say well thank you georgia for for that just a little bit of information about your experience there i am seeing now 15 questions uh and i'm going to start going through these um at least actually have you seen any of the questions that you would like to jump in on straight away? Because I'm not, I'm, I'm reading these for the first time now, so. <laughs> um, yeah, there are a couple about admissions and a couple about math. Maybe we can comment with George about math again, since we, we were just on the topic. Um, there's one question, one of the ones that came in recently, asking uh, if taking AS for the math would be a big advantage for studying international economics and finance or the standard math at A levels is considered to be enough. Well, I guess Georgia already told you she didn't do the A levels, she did, she did the IB, right, Georgia? Uh, but um, she did standard math. So what we try and underline and really try to convey with to um, potential applicants is that math is going to be involved if you study business related courses and in general Bocconi courses so having a quantitative background will help uh, it will not just this doesn't just mean math you could have done economics for IB or A levels you could have done physics you could have done uh, business all subjects that would have that would equip you with an analytical and quantitative background and mindset does this mean that you have you need any prerequisite? There was another question about IB prerequisite, for example. No. So when applying, you will not be evaluated based on did you do 
an A level in math or did you do IB um, further math or standard math? No. So there's no prerequisite when it comes to math for the application. But in case you get admitted, to be honest, having a strong background in math helps you transition a bit more smoothly to the subject that we teach at Bocconi. I think Georgia can maybe vouch for that. I mean, having that background helps you, especially in the first months, first semester and first year as well. But admission wise, you will not be, let's say, penalized for the type of math you have done at the high school level, okay? Uh, just bear in mind that, for example, if you are thinking of applying with the Bocconi test, that has more than half of questions that are related to math. So you might want to revise math a bit before taking the test. So uh, don't stress too much over it, but just think that it will be a part of your um, university life and of the application process when it comes to the content of the Bocconi um, test, sorry but not, again, as a prerequisite. OK, thank you, Elisa. I'm seeing a whole load of questions about maths. Do I need this subject? Do I need that? I think you just answered the fact that IB, you can take whatever you want within the IB. There are no prerequisites as such. Um, a no. lot of people asking about actual scores, though. Is there a score that you can give people on the IB that is um, an accurate uh, guide? I mean, yeah, obviously... Well, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it, grades account to 45% of the uh, criteria. I mean, if you're looking on A-levels a or IB, what can you say? I mean, I know it's difficult. Uh, no, one thing I forgot to mention before is that we do unconditional offers, which is different, especially if you guys are looking at UK universities. What does this mean? So if we do offer you a place, this will be related to the let's say admission elements we saw before so your grades from second class year of high school test results cv and personal statement but it will not be tied to your final high school living grade whether that is a levels or id you of course need to graduate with a full the full diploma so with a proper high school diploma and there are prerequisites for the a level for example you need at least to have three a levels for the ib you need the full ib diploma for the american diploma you need the american diploma plus three ap's but we won't set a minimum um, diploma score. Does this mean that everybody gets in? No, the application and the selection process is pretty tough. So what we see usually is students who are admitted at Bocconi tend to graduate from the IB with, I would say, at least a 36, so six in its subjects, more or less. From the A levels, what we tend to see students graduating with all A's, maximum one B. Um, from the American system with the GPA that it's usually around four, so something like that. But again, it's not a minimum, it's just for you to have an indication of the kind of student that then end up at Bocconi. This is one of these peculiarities of Italian universities in general, which is the entry requirements are literally three A-levels plus three GCSEs in six different subjects, and they can be all E's. It makes absolutely no difference. You're not going to get in with straight E's at Bocconi. No. That's absolutely not going to happen. There are other ways that that will be filtered out. But one point I do want to just address, Alisa, because it covers a couple of the questions. So forgive me if we're not answering anybody's specific question, but I know this gets to the, the heart of a lot of them. It's a little bit strange because you make unconditional offers. The final year of high school grades are not considered, are they? No. So it literally is, in a British context, external exams, which would be GCSEs at year 11, and what at year 12? What would you look at there? Um, so if, you know, some AS subjects still get gradings for the, the grades from those subjects, uh, any internal grades that you have um, that students can provide, you know, evidence for. So if the school leaves them, uh, gives them a certificate, giving an idea of the grades or, um, I don't know, uh, exams they have taken that specific year, that can be taken into account. If a student coming from the British system has nothing from the AES level, we know in some schools that happen, um, then the admissions office will duplicate your GCSEs um, GPA, basically. I see. So you would look at a school's assessment of the individual yes. as part if, of that? If, if provided, yes. Okay, and this ties in with another question that somebody was asking about gap years and deferred entry. Um, before I throw over to you on that, Elisa, this is also really important in the sense that if you were applying and you have already got your A-levels, 
those won't be taken into consideration because then they'll be viewing you on different criteria than all the other candidates. So it's a little bit strange to think that even after you've left school, they might not look directly at your A-levels. But on the wider point of deferred entry, Elisa, I'd like to throw that back over to you. Um, the answer is pretty simple. We don't do deferrals, uh, which I know for some students might be uh, not such good news. But the idea for us is that you can take a gap year. There's no problem in that. We won't penalize anybody for having taken a gap year after high school. But you need to apply when you're ready to start. So if you're applying now, for example, and for the early session, then the courses will start next September. So September 2023, um, you need to be here in September to start your courses if you get admitted. So we don't do deferrals. We cannot freeze, let's say, your place for the following year. So my suggestion is plan what you want to do and then apply accordingly because we cannot really do that. Okay. And just while we're still on the subject of entry requirements and all the rest of it, um, SAT scores, yeah. what can you say about those? I mean, again, I don't like these questions because it tries to pin an exact uh, number on something that is movable. And obviously your entry or is not purely on test scores anyway. So, you know, you might find somebody who's slightly weaker on the SATs gets in because of other reasons and so on. So there is never a clear answer to this question. I think really what I'm trying to get at is just to kind of be honest with people about when you don't stand a chance. You know, it's like, what are we looking at? What kind of range are we at? Yeah, but I perfectly get the question. I mean, uh, I would have the same probably doubts in my head and ask, you know, ask myself. So um, unfortunately, as we're mentioning, I cannot give you a number that will assure you 100% you will get in simply because as we saw before, the test is one of the two main elements of admission, but it's not the only one. So you can have a stellar SAT or ACT or Bocconi test, but if your grades are really, really low, then maybe you won't get in anyways. So this is the first thing you should keep in mind. The second thing that I urge you guys to keep in mind is that you make your own competition. Every admissions round, students make their own competition according to the GPA they have, the test grades they have. So it's hard for us to predict which will be, you know, a score that will allow you entrance to Bocconi. What I can tell you, though, to be honest, is that we have seen a rise in the SATs and ACTs in the past year, mainly past couple of years. In the past years, we have seen um, an increase in the scores we're receiving. Um, I would say we usually tell students that an SAT of around 1,350 starts to be a competitive score. Um, if we're looking at last year's rounds, though, I would say that trying to stay around 1,400 is it's, it's better, um, gives you better chances to get admitted. So the, the, score, the average, I would say, not the average, so yes, the average score has increased a bit. Um, with the ACT, uh, we're, I would say, around 28, 29 starts to be a good score. Does it mean you cannot apply if you have an SAT of 1,300? No, you can apply. To be realistic, from 1,350, it starts to be a competitive score. Then make your own, I would say, judgment also according to the grades you have, your uh, academic background, your CV, but that starts to be a competitive score. Um, ACT, as I said, 28, 29 up. Okay. Which leads me very neatly into the one question which I knew was going to be operated by people. Um, and again, one that perhaps relates to SATs and all the rest of it and entry requirements, the acceptance rate of Bocconi for undergraduate applicants. Can you say anything about that? Um, yes, I mean, again, guys, take this with a grain of salt because of what I said before. Um, first, the competition that can change every year, and second, the admissions round. One thing is applying in the early session, one thing is applying in the spring session. In the spring session, as I mentioned before, there are really, really few places available. So clearly, in that round, it can be harder to get in just because of the av availability, I would say, of the, of the spots. Um, the acceptance rate is around 17%, I would say, more or less. Uh, but again, guys, this number doesn't really tell you anything. Uh, what I would really suggest you to do is to work towards preparing a test, whether that is SAT, ACT, or the Bocconi test. You make your own choice, go on our website, have a look at the Bocconi test, or talk to your counselor about the SAT or the ACT. Choose one test, prefer that, prepare that one well, sorry, and try and get the best score that you can. Then 
depending on the year you're in, again, if we saw correctly, the vast majority of you guys here today are graduating next year. So there's not much you can do about your uh, past year grades. But again, you know your situation. So if you have to work a bit more towards your test because maybe your GPA wasn't super high, well, do that. Then always put some work in the CV and the personal statement. But don't get too, too anxious with numbers and acceptance rates because that won't help you and really won't tell you if you will get in or not, okay? Yeah. These are very blunt instruments which have got nothing to do with you as an individual. And I mean, they vary so much from one year to the, uh, the next and they're so dependent on external factors that I can't say that you can really read anything into it. However, the, the one thing I will say is that Bocconi is competitive. You already know that part. So, you know, don't expect it to be easy, but you know, if you're in the mix, put yourself out there. You never know what's going to happen. And like, and as Elisa was saying, there are two, three windows of which you can apply, four programs you can apply for. So essentially, you know, if you really want, wanted to, you could say there are 12 chances of getting in, you know, whether that means your chances are any better with one of those applications than the others, who knows. Uh, but I do just want to pick up on one thing you said there, Elisa, about preparing for the test, specifically with the Bocconi test. What kind of resources are already available? Because I know this is new, this is different. So if people are looking at stuff from last year, it's going to be wrong. Where do they go to find that information? Um, if you go on our admission website, which is unibocconi.eu slash admissions, um, the pages are currently being updated by our, by our admissions office, but the vast majority of the information is already up there. Uh, you find a very thorough description of the test, the different topics that the test entails, and a description of the subjects you should revise and prepare in order to be able uh, to, let's say, answer questions related to those areas. I think in the next few days, they should upload the new, uh, a couple of new test samples that you can take into account uh, and practice on in order to prepare for the test. Um, since the test has changed more towards the SAT, I would say, structure. What we would advise to is, anyways, you can use the SAT prep books to prepare for the test, especially for the analytical and logical part. So that is definitely something that you can do. Okay, great. Thanks very much. So I think that more or less covers all the questions on entry requirements and grades and which subjects do you need to do. Uh, we have got one question here, which hopefully you can just pick up on very quickly, Lisa. For Italians, do they can they do the test in English or Italian? Is there an Italian version of it, or do you have to do the English version for the English spoke English talk courses? No, 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 they can choose. That's actually a great question. So, um, when applying, you will be able to choose if you want to take the test in English or in Italian. This will be regardless of the type of applicant. So if you're an international Italian applicant, and regardless of the sub the courses, sorry, that you listed as the ones you're interested in. Okay, and on the subject of Italians, and as we've already pointed out, I guess George wasn't is an Italian as well, from an admissions point of view, if people have multiple passports and so on, uh, how do they show up in your system? Should somebody with an Italian passport and another one always apply as an Italian or is there any kind uh, of... No, we actually don't look at passports, so we do not mean. Uh, in order to differentiate the type of applicants and candidates, we don't look at passports, but we look at where the student is studying. So an Italian who's studying in the UK, as Georgia did, for us is an international candidate, no matter the passport. What counts is where the student is going to graduate. If he or she is going to graduate outside Italy or at an international school, then they are an international applicant, um, regardless of their passport. They will, of course, need to upload and list the type of passports they have in the application process. Um, and they can list up to two, if I'm not wrong. So if you have more than one passport, you can absolutely do that. Uh, but that won't, I would say, affect your the, the category in which you will be put, because you will be anyways an international student if you're studying abroad. So it really doesn't make any difference from an admissions point of view. Uh, one thing I would always say, and this is just general advice right now, is if you have an EU passport and you consider yourself British, please use your EU passport to go and study in Italy. Life will be and just you so much more passports, easy. which one, whichever you want. I mean, if you are both an Italian and British national, you can put the British passport first 
uh, that's wonderful. So we see that you also have, you know, uh, um, a foreign nationality that is perfect. And then you list the Italian one. Uh, if I know some people have three, four passports, they cannot list all of them. What can also happen is that you list the first two. And then if you have an Italian passport you haven't listed, you can always bring it up when it comes to, for example, um, the visa process or the permit of stay process, since those are not necessary for Italian passport holders. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, one final question on ad admissions and uh, application processes. Um, I'm guessing this is from one of our non UK attendees. If you've taken the IB, do you still have to do the language test? Or is the um, no, so students who are attending a full English taught diploma, so IB, A levels, American diploma, um, they do not, they're not required to have any additional language uh, certificate or prerequisite. Your diploma is what we need. Right. Okay. I'm now going to move on into a slightly different area, still connected with you, Elisa. Georgia, we have got a few for you as well. Um, this one's more about money and merit scholarships. Um, can you say anything about how a student would improve their chances of getting one? Um, yeah, so the process of allocating the merit scholarship is pretty straightforward. So it basically takes into account the same elements we consider for admission. So you should have really, really good grades, really high grades and very, very competitive test scores, whether that is SATs, ACTs or Bocconi tests. Um, those scholarships are awarded to the really top candidates in round, so the top candidates in the admission rankings uh, can be offered a 100% or 50% tuition waiver. So if you want to enhance your chances, I would say, and you still have time to work on your grades, because maybe you're in your third last year of high school, do that. If you're in your second class year of high school, you already know you have got really, really good grades in high school, then prepare well for the test and aim at really high scores um, in order to try and lend yourself a scholarship. As I mentioned before, do not forget the CV and the personal statement that for scholarship reasons are always taken into account. But anyways, you really have to be in the top part of the ranking for those to be taken into account. But it's the same application process. There's nothing new that they have to provide they over and above. No, no, whenever a candidate applies, they're automatically evaluated for a merit scholarship. A different thing is if we're talking about need-based scholarships or fee reductions, those ones, of course, require an application because students need to send in documents about the family economic and social, uh, sorry, economic and income situation. Um, but if we're talking about merit, so academic merit scholarship, those do not require an application. And you know if you got the scholarship or not, at the same time, you know the admission result. Would that apply for need-based ones as well? No. Do you, so do you no. only start the application for those after you've received an offer? Yes. Or, right. Yes. Okay. Because there's no point doing it otherwise, I suppose. Yes. Is there? <laughs> Just a lot of work. Um, and, okay, so we've answered that question. This next one is, well, I'm interested because it's never come up before. With so many exchanges, what percentage of students on campus at any given time are just there for one term? Hmm. So this is a very tricky question. I think that nearly half of the students, I don't want to be mistaken, but if I got this correctly, nearly half of the students go on exchange, a bit less than half, but that's the kind of percentage we're aiming at. Uh, there's a selection again, as I said before, um, so not everybody gets to go, but it's a selection based on your GPA from your first and second year, basically. Um, but nearly half of the students tend to go. Then there are some exceptions. The International Politics Program, for example, has a mandatory exchange incorporated. So all students attending the International Politics course need to go on exchange. So for them, the percentages are a bit different. What I would say is that students in their first and second year are at Bocconi. They tend to stay at Bocconi unless they're doing internships during summer, but that's, that might mean they just, you know, come a bit later on in September or leave a bit early in, in June. Um, third year students tend to be around a lot, whether they're, they're on exchange or they're doing an internship. Some of them maybe start summer internships that runs, but, uh, you know, uh, long during falls, up during fall, others, finish their course and exams pretty early. So they decide to go on internship in the second semester. Um, but that's, so third year students tend to be uh, quite often either on exchange or on an internship. One thing that I would urge any, anyways to consider is that 
we send a lot of students, the third year students on exchange, but we also receive students who are coming from our pot universities. And every semester we get something around 1000 exchange students on campus, which is a huge number. And that, you know, um, also makes the international student body even more international, even if it's for just a shorter period of time, but that, that's really interesting too. No, it's quite an interesting question because I, I read it in a way that sort of suggested perhaps that your own own full time students might in some way be swamped by exchange students coming in all the time just for a short period of time and then disappearing again, which I know can happen at some you know American universities in Europe, for example, where everybody is doing study abroad basically. But no, you're a very very it's a very very different setup from that, isn't it? I suppose yeah, it's basically the number of students that gets out of Bocconi so that goes in exchange is similar to the number of students from exchange partners coming in so it's a good balance we, we it's not unbalanced at all but georgia how was the process for you of choosing where to go on exchange i mean did you get to, are, are you going where you wanted or are you kind of going where you were left with or how did how did that work really because i know these things like everything else at Bocconi, competitive is going to come into it isn't it Yes, yes, I would say, I mean, Bocconi is a very meritocratic university in the sense that everything is based off of the GPA. Um, I'm very grateful because I got the my first choice um, to, to study in, in Chile. Um, uh, but I would say it depends on where you want to go. The way that the process works is you apply uh, the beginning of the second semester of your second year, although many students already to begin with the first year have some ideas in mind um, just because it is a, a GPA that you build up throughout your, your three semesters. Um, and this is speaking not for the politics and governance uh, program, but for all the other bachelors, you have a, an application window where you have a list of all the universities available in all the different regions. And then uh, some are specific to your program. So for example, in the economic and social sciences, there's special universities reserved for us. So I know, for example, a lot of last space, um, I think one of the big ones was, was Dartmouth for, for our course, uh, but then you apply and then you get put in a ranking and based off of that, um, yes, you get assigned a university and you can choose up to 10 different options. So you can diversify your, your location. I'm pretty sure everybody gets one of their 10, don't they? I don't think it's ever going to give you the case that will be rejected by everywhere. No. But, you know, names and reputations do play a role in this as they do with everything else. So uh, everybody tends to chase, or I guess a, a lot of people are intent on chasing the same handful of, of universities, yeah. I would imagine. And I would say they're all very, very top universities. At the end, no one is, I think the majority of students that apply and get accepted tend to go. So it's a... Uh, Excellent, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, this is something we've seen with Bacconi time and again, that it's... Uh, the quality of the partnerships are as one of the main reasons why you would choose to go there in the first place, I would suggest. Um, we are coming up to about an hour. I've got one more question that I des definitely do want to get to. And again, Georgia, this is going to be mostly about you. Well, I want you to answer it because you're the one actually living it right now. It's to do with estimates of living costs in Milan for students. Now, perhaps I know you're completing your second year now. I know in the first year you were in university halls of residence, right? Second year, I'm not so sure. Did you move out or you stayed in? So second year, I actually moved out. I'm now in my own apartment with three friends of mine from the residence. So, yeah. Okay. So the first question I've got for you is quite simply, what difference did that make to your outgoings, you know, versus being on campus and being outside of campus? How, how, how much, well, which is more expensive, would I say? I would say for me, it's very similar costs. Um, although, yes, I mean, you have access to the... the residence hall fees on the websites and then with apartments in general to give a very wide range i think you can go from 500 600 euros to over a thousand euros so it really depends on on the type of budget that you have um in terms of way of living i i would definitely encourage trying to get into the residences or yes having the the university residence experience um i got very lucky i was in one called Dubini, and there I was very, very international. I met my, my closest friends there, and you meet people from different years and different um, courses and countries. And so very big group going out, especially at the beginning with the welcome weeks, uh, you know, exploring the, the social life of Milan, which there is a lot of. We, we spoke a lot about the academics. You, know, you work hard, but you also uh, have a lot of free time. And, and uh, yes, there are a lot of social activities. Then. Um, so yeah, that was my experience in the residence. Apartments, you do have a lot more of independence, um, but, and, and the majority of students tend to live outside of residence halls. So maybe that's different to the UK system because there, are, there is a limited number, um, but 
yes, uh, there's a lot of places near university that you can choose to live in, so that doesn't change much. Well, I know that from European standards, or by European standards, Bocconi has quite a large number of residences available. So, uh, but, you know, not for everybody, obviously, but I think for the majority of your incoming international students, you ought to be able to find somewhere for them to live. Um, yeah, we do not have place for everybody, unfortunately. So we try to give precedence to first year overseas students who, of course, might have a bit more difficulty in finding a place. Uh, we have a total of around eight uh, residence halls for uh, 2000 places, more or less. Um, but again, we cannot accommodate everybody. So what we suggest to international students, especially if you do not know anybody in Milan, is to apply for residences and apply as soon as the application for residences is open in May, there is a day called click day where you have to be there and send your application in. Um, as Georgia said, if you manage to do it, it's a great experience. If you don't, do not panic because really a lot of the apartments that are rented out close to the university area are, you know, rented to Bocconi students. So you will anyways meet uh, fellow students or freshmen there. Uh, but definitely, if you can land a place in the Bocconi dorms, especially if you don't know anybody, it can be an advantage uh, or help, an additional help in the first weeks. Right. And Elisa, just while we're on that subject of money, um, yep. the question I was actually asking, what is a budget? What budget could you have? Um, I mean honestly, when I talk to students, I tell them to take into account something between 800 and 1,000 euros per month, 1,000 euros per month, I would say, as, you know, to cover all the expenses. Georgia just mentioned to rent out a room in Milan close to Bocconi, rents range from 500, 550, I would say, per month to then whatever you want to spend if you want to stay, you know, in a, a wonderful apartment on your, by yourself. Um, but if we consider that half or a bit more than half of the budget is going to be for rent, um, books, food, public transport. Public, public transport is super cheap in Milan. It's the cheapest thing for students. Is around. Is it still 27 euros per month, 30 euros, Georgia? I don't know, but it's... Honestly, I, I walk the majority of Milan, which is also better for Okay. Milan. It's two euros per ride, but yes, I think so. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cheap. But I would say considering 800, 1,000 euros per month can, can be um, utilities, internet, so around 1,000 can work. Then, of course, it depends what you guys want to do. If you want to go every weekend to the seaside, take a flight to Barcelona or whatever, then that won't cut it. But if we're talking about average uh, cost, that is, I think, the, the amount you should keep in mind. I don't know, Georgia, if you have anything you want to comment on, if it sounds right to you. No, I think everything is right. The majority is rent and then, yeah, very different lifestyles, I think, of yeah. students here. So it's hard to give an exact number. So yeah, I mean, Milan is not a cheap city, but you compare that with London, yeah, it's it's not expensive, really. There are definitely cheaper cities in Italy that we have to be honest about, but at the same time, something that Georgia said before is the opportunities and the lifestyle that you have in Milan, the internationality, the uh, cultural things going on, the, the, the student life in general, the social life that you can have, um, that, of course, is different from what you might find in a smaller town or city in Italy. So um, things, I think, need to be considered all together. Right. Well, we have now reached one hour and two minutes of this webinar. So I'm going to bring proceedings to a halt right now and say thank you very much, Georgia, for coming. Thanks also, Elisa, for being with us. Um, hopefully you found that useful and it's given you a lot more insight as to what going to Bocconi involves. Um, it's not easy. The best things in life never are. Um, but, you know, if you need any further assistance or support with this, please do let us know. We'll be delighted to help you out. Um, all of you will receive an email from me tomorrow where I'm going to put a load of links into some of the things we've referred to, some of the things we didn't quite mention, but might also be useful for you. Um, so I'll send that through to you along with a link to the recording of this session, which should be on YouTube sometime tomorrow. So once again, thanks very much, Georgia. Thanks very much, Elisa. And thanks everybody else for coming along. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Mark. Bye.